Okay, welcome back, guys. Um, so I'll pretty much uh, take off from where uh, Lou Derry left off uh, um, about carbon cycle on our planet. Uh, he primarily talked about exogenic carbon cycle, how carbon is exchanged between the surficial reservoirs and weathering and so sources and sinks. Uh, I will try to take you guys down farther deep, sort of maybe to the base of the lithosphere or somewhat deeper uh, into the upper mantle, how carbon moves uh, as an element uh, between various reservoirs. Um, and how carbon imparts some of the, how, how it affects some of the processes in, in, in the Earth's upper mantle. And uh, given the theme of this cider, I'll try to focus more on the subduction zone processes and um, processes in the continental lithospheric mantles and how com carbon can play actually an important role in, primarily in magma generation in various locales uh, in, in, in these domains. Uh, Many of you have seen me show you this plot before, but for, uh, for the students, I think it's an important slide to remind you guys that when we talk about carbon cycles, if you open up any textbooks, most of the time you look at a carbon cycle where carbon is exchanged between various artificial reservoirs, right? Uh, like hydrosphere, atmosphere, biosphere, and so on. And I just pulled up one of these cartoons, and what I have done here is, um, noted down the fluxes, which is in the order of 10 to the power 14 gram of car carbon per year, and the reservoir uh, sizes, which is in the order of 10 to the power 17 gram of carbon. So if you do the ratio of fluxes and the reservoir sizes, you can get a rough estimate of the residence time of carbon in each of these surface reservoirs. And as you can see, uh, if you do the ratio of these numbers, it's in the order of 100 to 1,000 years, okay? So that's sort of the uh, amount of time each atom of carbon would spend in these surficial reservoirs. However, uh, and this is the short-term carbon cycle or surficial carbon cycle, but there is also a carbon cycle which uh, involves uh, subduction of um, slab with crust and the mantle materials with some amount of carbon back into the mantle and release of carbon by partial melt generation and magmatism and, and volcanic uh, outpouring at interplate uh, volcanoes, at ridges, and uh, along uh, volcanic arcs, and perhaps some um, uh, within intracontinental uh, magmatism as well. Uh, in this carbon cycle, again, the numbers are much more uncertain, and uh, I'm just uh, pulling out a figure from one of our recent review papers, and as you can see quickly, uh, the fluxes are in the order of 10 to the power 13 gram of carbon per year. Uh, so similar to the surficial carbon cycle fluxes. However, the reservoir sizes are much larger, right? So uh, sort of 1 to 10 times 10 to the power 23 gram of carbon in the mantle, around 1 times 10 to the power 23 gram of carbon uh, on continents and, and, and oceanic crust and so on. So if you again do the ratio of these two numbers, you immediately realize in long-term carbon cycle, the residence time you are thinking is a sort of on the order of a billion year, uh, or hundreds of million years to a billion year, right? And uh, I will uh, go into detail how we actually estimate some of these fluxes. Here I'm just showing you some numbers, now this time with uncertainties, uh, although I think these uncertainties do not en encompass all the potential uh, other causes of uncertainties. Um, and specifically I will focus on the fact that if you look at the subduction cycling of carbon in, uh, in convergent margins, about one third of the carbon seems to be getting out in arc volcanoes, including for arc fluxes and so on, whereas uh, remainder two thirds of the input carbon is actually going down deeper into the mantle, and how we actually estimate that. And then um, I will also go into uh, some of the processes that may potentially take place in terms of partial melt generation, in the continental lithospheric mantle or at the base of the continental lithospheric mantle and how carbon may be playing a critical role in, in, in such melting. Um, so again, uh, these are some of the numbers we, we put out uh, in terms of the concentration of carbon or CO2 in the mantle, 50 to 200 ppm CO2 in the depleted mantle or maybe up to 1,000 ppm CO2 in the enriched mantle. And if you, if you multiply these concentrations by the mass of the mantle, you can get these numbers, yeah? So it's very simple. Um, okay, 
Now, how do we estimate fluxes of carbon coming out of the mantle? Uh, this applies generally, but this definitely applies for uh, volcanic arcs. Uh, so how do we actually know carbon is coming out of the mantle? Uh, there are many uh, direct and indirect ways of estimating CO2 fluxes out of the mantle. One problem, one particular problem in estimating CO2 outflux from the mantle is the fact that uh, it, it, it's a volatile uh, gas, so it, it, it releases into the atmosphere, and it's not necessarily preserved in magmatic glasses, and it's not a conservative tracer. Uh, as a consequence, you will have to rely on some other techniques. However, people do uh, make direct measurement of CO2 in man mantle-derived melts and glasses. Uh, people also measure uh, CO2 in mantle-derived fluids. Uh, this could be trapped gas bubbles in, in, in basalts. It could be hydrothermal vent fluids uh, or, or sort of hydrothermal plumes and gases. Uh, and I think Lou quickly mentioned about this. Uh, another uh, very commonly used approach is to measure the ratio of CO2 to some other uh, independent uh, incompatible element ratio, where people think the incompatibility of that species would be similar to that of CO2. So people look at CO2 helium ratio, CO2 argon, CO2 niobium, CO2 chlorine ratio. And if you have independent estimates of this denominator in any of these, uh, and if you can measure this ratio well, you can figure out the CO2 outflux. So that's how some of these uh, outflux estimates are, are actually calculated from various studies. Okay. Um, so this sort of flux estimate uh, works really well for uh, oceanic provinces like mid-oceanic ridges, ocean islands, uh, volcanic arcs. But then there is also uh, the evidence of uh, carbon-rich magmas uh, erupting on continents. Um, and so you have uh, these strange magmas called carbonatitic melt or carbonatite, which has uh, 38 to 45% CO2, less than uh, 5 to 10% silica. Uh, Michael talked about uh, eruption of viscous magma, and if this guy plays well, see how carbonatitic magmas actually erupt. These are extremely fluid-like uh, magma. The viscosity of these things are like water. Uh, so they flow down, uh, uh, if I can get to play it again, um, so it's a completely different eruption regime uh, than, than what Michael has mentioned. Uh, so 10 to the power zero pascal second viscosity, um, liquidus temperature of 500 degrees or 550 degrees. They don't even glow at, uh, at, at daytime. You can see them glowing at nighttime. Uh, so there is a current uh, actively uh, erupting carbon uh, volcano in, in Aldonio Lengai in Tanzania, and there are other historic uh, carbonatitic eruptions on continents. One interesting thing about these CO2 rich, extremely CO2 rich magmas, is they mostly erupt on continents. There are a couple of locations of report of carbonatitic eruption on ocean islands, like Cape Verde and Canaries, but they are somewhat debated whether they are truly oceanic or not. Uh, and similarly, you have kimberlite eruption. Again, uh, there are indirect evidence of kimberlites on oceanic provinces, but they are mostly restricted to continents. So there may be something special going on in terms of the uh, petrogenetic uh, settings beneath continents that probably promote a generation of carbonatitic magmas or kimberlitic magma. And of course, they bring up diamonds and so on. Uh, just to quickly point out what sort of the CO2 concentration in primary kimberlitic magma that people estimate, they are not as extreme as carbon, carbonatites, but they are still pretty extreme, like 25 to 10% CO2, primary CO2 content in these magmas. So these are silicate melts, um, silicate magmas with uh, 25 to 30% silica, but very high CO2 contents. Okay, so first, um, thinking about carbon cycle in subduction zones and specifically uh, the quest some of the questions that I think we will try to uh, address in this talk is thinking of convergent margins of subduction zones as loci of continent formation. Uh, does the present-day subduction processes lead to efficient release of CO2 from the deep interior to the exogenic uh, reservoir? And did the fluxes of CO2 in and out of the subduction zones vary through time? So let's just look at the subduction zone processes and the fate of carbon in subduction zones and ask ourselves the question, uh, did the mantle and exospheric reservoirs communicate uh, 
when the continent bu building process was going on through time. Okay? Did the continent building pro process as we understand it in subduction zones impart a strong climatic, long-term climatic um, you know, imprint by releasing CO2 or, or drawing down CO2? Yes. Well, uh, I sort of define it loosely. Any th in my world, anything above Moho is exosphere. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, however, when I say exogenic here, however, in my world, when I say exogenic, I, I mean above crust, whatever is released by magma. So upper crust is exogenic. Okay, uh, so in order to understand um, carbon cycling in subduction zones, first thing you'll have to uh, understand that when slab enters the trench, goes down deep into the mantle, all the three different lithologies that, that comprise this slab, overlying sediments, uh, altered oceanic crust, basaltic crust, and the lithospheric mantle, all of these lithologies seem to have some uh, carbon in them as they are entering the trench. So you have carbonate-bearing pelletic sediments uh, or carbonate-rich sediments like pure uh, limestones. You have altered oceanic crust where uh, seawater CO2 reacts with basalts to form veins or, or vesicles filled with uh, carbonate minerals like calcite. You also have similar reaction going on uh, between peridotite and, and um, and seawater to form calcitic veins. And all of these lithologies can carry carbon down into the mantle. Now the question is, what's the probability of these carbon bound in sediments or basalts or peridotite uh, to stay in these lithologies as they go down? Or what's the probability of these lithologies releasing or giving off its carbon budget as they are getting processed in the subduction factory? Okay. Uh, now, there are various different approaches people take in estimating this uh, carbon input into the subduction zone and carbon output, either at four arcs or at volcanic arcs. Uh, Lou mentioned about uh, looking at uh, natural estimates of carbon content of the downgoing lithologies and estimating carbon content in the primary volcanic uh, arc magmas. So that would be constraints of slab input and arc output based on natural samples. However, the thing that I'm probably going to spend more time on uh, would be the forward approach where one can do thermodynamic modeling like some sort of Gibbs free energy minimization uh, approach to calculate the equilibrium phase assemblage in a fluid bearing system, in a CO2 or water bearing system. Uh, many of you probably know uh, software packages like Parplex and Thermocalc allow you to uh, do this type of uh, modeling. However, the limitation of this type of uh, approach is they sort of do a pretty decent job up to the metamorphic devolatilization step, but the, the magma generation or partial melting is difficult to handle in these models. So we also conduct laboratory experiments uh, to constrain devolatilization and partial melting of these downgoing lithologies and put another, another sort of uh, constraints, uh, figuring out the role of carbon and how carbon is partitioning between the solid residue and the fluids and the melts. Okay, um, one problem, no matter whether you do the thermodynamic modeling approach or experiment, uh, experimental approach, is knowing what's actually is going down, right? And again, Lou mentioned this. Uh, unfortunately, all the, the composition of the oceanic crust, we do not really have a continuous coverage. We have these sporadic uh, drill cores. We have more estimates for sediments, but it's extremely heterogeneous. We have less estimates for the uh, crystalline or, or igneous crust part, but we do have some understanding how the alteration process works, how the sedimentation of carbonate-rich sediments work um, along the ocean basins. So um, based on that, especially for the altered oceanic crust, and again, I think this plot uh, from Alton Teagle was shown before, uh, what we find out is there is actually a positive correlation between the bulk CO2 weight percent of the bulk crust with the age of the crust. Uh, and this is because of the fact that the alteration process is, is not just a precipitation of carbonates on the ocean floor. It's actually a reaction of seawater, CO2, and calcium from the basaltic crust to make these carbonate veins. And so 
in most part, it's actually a near, near isochemical addition of CO2 into the ocean crust. And this sort of alteration process is not only restricted to the high temperature hydrothermal systems near mid oceanic ridges, they actually continue as the crust stages. So if you are at older oceanic basins, in the upper volcanics, you tend to have more carbonates or more bulk CO2 content, whereas in, in younger uh, sea floor, you have less CO2 content. Of course, um, so this sort of 2 to 5 percent CO2 in, um, in oceanic crust of around 100 million years or older is restricted to only the top 200 to 500 meter of the crust because the permeability of the crust uh, diminishes pretty rapidly as you go down. Uh, so in order to estimate what's the bulk carbon content in the form of uh, locked up carbonates going down into the trench, you, you can't just you know, multiply this concentration by the seven kilometers of crust. You'll have to take into account how this concentration is lower and lower into the sheeted dike proportion in the Gabbro and so on. When we do that, we, we, know, we sort of estimate uh, the bulk CO2 content of the oceanic crust, seven kilometers thick, is in the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 weight percent CO2, okay? not, not two to five. But the top portion is preferentially enriched. The other thing that's very important, and I think this is very critical in, in not only estimating the present day slab input, uh, but also estimating or, or uh, understanding the slab into an input going back in time, is if you look at all the lithologies combined, meaning the mantle lithosphere, sediments, and metabasols, uh, about half of the total carbon going into the trenches is actually locked up in oceanic crust, altered oceanic crust. Uh, maybe around a quarter or so uh, is in the, in the mantle lithosphere. However, this number is highly uncertain. And uh, the rest in organic carbon in sediments and carbonates in sediments. But again, this number is highly variable. This is like a global average based on present day estimates. Um, there are subduction zones where there are barely any carbonate sediments, so then this budget would dominate. If you zoom in into the crustal budget, so if you leave out the mantle lithosphere, again, uh, about two-thirds of the total carbon budget is actually in the metabasols or in, in altered oceanic crust, igneous crust, and about a third is in carbonate sediments. Roger, yes. It's dominated by carbonates at the present day. Well... So, I mean, th this, so the mantle lithosphere, I think it's mostly carbonates, although you do have some uh, reduced carbon. Carbonate sediments, of course, it's carbonates. Oceanic metabasols, again, you do have some organic carbon, but again, it's mostly carbonates. So I think this pie chart roughly tells you the mass proportion of reduced versus oxidized carbon. So it's dominated by oxidized carbon, at least yeah, now. Okay. Doing acid extraction. Right. And uh, so they got the carbonates and they didn't get the reduced carbon. But with some um, thermal decomposition methods, people are finding more organic carbon and isotopically lighter in the oceanic part of the crust. So that's sort of an evolving picture, I'd say. Okay. This is in the last year or two. Okay. Um, Alicia. Uh, good, good question. I think, I think so you, you'll see where I would like to get, go with this is sort of this uh, relative mass flux of carbon going in to the deep mantle versus carbon outgassing in, in the arcs. It actually, well, it's not, it doesn't matter. It does matter, but it will actually help the story I'll, I'll actually try to tell you. Um, it may have other implications in terms of the you know, the redox influence of carbon subduction into the mantle and so on, but the story that I'm trying to go with today in terms of, okay, would carbon survive in the downgoing slab, having organic or reduced carbon would actually even help the story. So I'll, I'll, you'll see why, why I say that. But, I yeah. Uh, sink. Yeah, sink. 
So again, uh, so the next thing, once you sort of estimate what's the CO2 content of each of these lithologies and you have estimates of the bulk composition of the lithologies in terms of major elements, you can then play this forward game of, okay, as a function of pressure and temperature path of the downgoing slab, what are the equilibrium phase assemblages as you go down deeper and where is carbon stored in what phase? Okay, so this is sort of uh, one of the earlier experimental papers, a phase diagram, temperature increasing to the right, pressure increasing downward. Uh, these are various uh, devolatilization reactions for a simplified uh, altered oceanic crust system. So it has CO2, it has water, and it has all the key major element ingredients to make the major uh, phases in the igneous crust. And these numbers next to these lines are the mole fraction of CO2 released in the fluid, okay, in the released fluid, okay? And what you can see is when I superimpose the various estimates of pressure temperature trajectories of downgoing slab surface uh, paths, uh, they do not cross devolatilization reactions which release a CO2 rich fluid. They do devolatilize, but the, the released fluid is actually a water rich fluid. In other words, um, in these experimental works, or the models developed based on these experiments by Molina and Poli, uh, argues that in the shallow part of the subduction where, where your crust is undergoing extensive dehydration, carbonates actually remain as a refractory phase in the residual eclogite. So now basalt is transforming to eclogite, but carbonate minerals as accessory phases are sticking around in the crust, and you are releasing a water-rich fluid. Bob? Sure. So the Peacock estimate, Peacock estimate is an older one. In, in some of the diagrams I'm going to show you, I'll, I'll include all the newer um, paths, but I think still the story is uh, sort of the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that goes the early part of subduction where uh, devolatilization reactions are dominating. Uh, the crust is undergoing extensive dehydration, and we are tracking how carbon is behaving in that system. But then uh, somewhat deeper uh, down the line, and depending on how much water you have available in the bulk system, your subducting assemblages, crust, sediments, and perhaps even the lithosphere, may also undergo partial melting. Now the question becomes is, what is the fate of carbon or carbonates uh, if subducting slabs undergo partial melting. Uh, so what we need to know is where is the solid eye of various uh, carbonate bearing lithologies and how do those solid eye or, or the first melting conditions compare with the PT paths of subductions. If you have the PT paths of subductions hotter than the solid eye, you would predict carbon release in the mantle wedge, whereas if the solid eye are hotter, then the PT paths of subduction, you would predict preservation of carbon in the downgoing slab, right? Simple game. Okay, so in the, this slide and the next two slides, I'm just going to give you a quick summary of last 10 years worth of experimental work that have gone on into figuring out the phase equilibria or the phase relations of carbonate bearing uh, lithologies uh, at high pressure temperature conditions. So um, there are a series of curves, so just to confuse you, I guess. Um, all these dotted lines are slab surface pressure temperature trajectories for various subduction zones. And I show only the ones where carbonate bearing sediments uh, are an important contributor just to keep things consistent. However, this phase diagram is done for carbonate bearing basalts or carbonated eclogite, basaltic eclogite. And the solid lines are the solid eye or devolatilization or melting reactions of uh, various assemblages. And as you can see, between studies, the estimates of solidus temperatures, exactly at what temperatures they are located, or the shape of the solidus curves vary widely. And some of the systematics, just to you know, simplify things, I have marked against these curves is what is the equilibrium carbonate mineral stable in the residue. So magnesium calcite here, uh, dolomite, magnesite solid solution here, magnesium calcite here. And sort of a ballpark, just to keep things simple, at any given pressure, 
if your bulk composition allows you to stabilize a more calcite-rich solid solution in the residue, the solidus temperature of the carbonate mineral tends to be hotter. Whereas if, you, if your bulk composition allows you to stabilize a more magnesium or dolomitic solid solution, carbonate melting temperatures are relatively lower. Okay? However, as you can see, no matter which solid I, no matter which solidus you take, and no matter which subduction zone PT paths you follow, you are not going to liberate or release carbonate melts in subduction zones, right? Because all the solidus temperatures are hotter. You can encounter hydrous solidus. Um, however, across this line, this black line, the melt that you will generate is a highly siliceous rhyolitic hydrous melts, and the CO2 solubility is limited in that. Carbonates will still be preserved in the crust. Yes, Roberta. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Um, so now this is for sediments. Again, uh, sedimentary compositions can vary a lot. Um, and again, the hydrous, I did not plot it here, but the hydrous, meaning fluid present or water present, uh, pelletic sediment solidus is around 750 or so around here. Okay. So all the subduction PT paths, the slab surface temperatures, these dotted curves will pass through that. You know, in other words, if you have excess water in the system down to subarc depths of around 100 kilometers or so, you will, your, your downgoing sediments will undergo hydrous partial melting. However, carbonates will still be pres preserved in the crust. And in order to release carbonate minerals, again, you need to encounter these gray boundaries, gray solid uh, boundaries, these are the complete decarbonation or carbonate melting boundaries. And they are still hotter than most of the downgoing, uh, downgoing PT paths. As you can see, the path for Cascadia can encounter uh, some of the carbonate melting conditions, but Cascadia does not have any carbonate bearing sediments. So if you look at all the present day subduction zones where carbonated sediments are, are an important component on the ocean floor. All of their PT paths are cooler than the phase relations uh, that we, we interpret. So the story from altered oceanic crust and sediments would be that carbonate remains largely stable in the downgoing lithology, and CO2 release is, is minimal. Okay. Ah. That's probably, a, well, carbon is in the sediments. Lou, do you have any query? What was the question? Why Cascadia subduction zones do not have carbonate sediments? Oh, wow. I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's probably a productivity issue. Or... Yeah, partly there's not a lot of that kind of uh, calcareous plankton production out there. Right. I have a question in you know, continental settings. You get metamorphic decarbonation at much less. Sure. What we see sure. You you you'll see that there are two competing things going on uh, that can limit or enhance your metamorphic de decarbonation. One is the availability of water. How much? Uh, what sort of the net water CO2 ratio of the fluid and how it's changing if it's an open system process or not. And the other thing is pressure. Most of the continental uh, decarbonation reactions you are talking about these are relatively very low pressure water induced decarbonation. Carbonate stability is a strongly a factor of pressure. So when, whenever in all these lithologies, sediments um, or, or altered oceanic crust, if you are above around 2 GPA or so, like 60, 70 kilometers or deeper, carbonates are strongly stable. So even with the excess fluid in the system, their decarbonation is not that favored. Roberta. Sure. Yeah. And this is true in the crust or in That's right. It, it won't be That's right. That's right. And in fact, all the reactions I show here uh, are all carbonate silicate mixtures. So these are your best case scenario in breaking carbonates down. If I put a phase diagram of limestone, they would be probably somewhere up here. Uh, yeah, of course, their worst case scenario in, in, in breaking down carbonates in the subduction zones. If you have a mixture 
more impure, uh, like mud, lime mud, then you have a best case scenario. But the point here is even in those cases, the solidus temperatures appear to be hotter than PT pans. Uh, the last but not the least is the carbonate bearing lithospheric mantle. And this is actually the best case scenario in preserving carbonates in the lithosphere. Uh, because here the, the sort of the crust and mantle interface temperatures are much cooler. You have a strong temperature gradient as you grow from the slab surface, uh, slab mantle interface and deeper. So those paths are nowhere near sort of the carbonate bearing melting uh, conditions of peridotite no matter whether it's in the presence of water or in the absence of water. So if you have any carbonates uh, that are precipitating in the mantle by percolation of seawater down through cracks in the mantle lithospheres, those carbonates are going to be stable. Okay? And uh, Sinti, to go back to your question about organic carbon, if I assume organic carbon would mostly be in the form of graphite and then at deeper depths maybe in the form of diamonds, they are going to be stable. I mean, their, their stability is even... Much greater than carbonates. Doug? Yeah, so uh, the water cycle is made uncertain in the open straight mantle due to the fact we don't know how much water circulates in the open straight mantle. Is that the same? Yeah, it's the same uncertainty for carbonates. That's why I am very hesitant and I put a question mark in the mass flux of CO2 entering the trench in the form of lithospheric mantle. It's a, it's a very poorly known number, but, but the point is uh, either it's more or less it should go down deeper into the mantle uh, pretty much under any circumstance. Yeah. Serpentinization, right. And you have two, uh, two locations, I suppose, where you can get this deep penetration of uh, seawater. Of course, you can have some in the mid-oceanic ridge settings, but then in the, in the outer rise, you may have these bending falls which you know, propagate fairly deep and you can have serpentinite as well as this carbonate formation as well. Yes? Uh, I'm, I guess I'm not differentiating. Uh, in terms of understanding its phase stability, it doesn't matter as long as as long as it manifests itself in the form of a graphite or something, yeah. And I think it's also related to what Lewis was saying earlier, but my perspective is I don't think we have that much organic carbon that would be going down into the clouds. Well, that, 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 was my, that was my slide to begin with, but as Lou was pointing out, maybe, maybe the fraction is higher. But the point would be uh, if you have more organic carbon in terms of the deeper cycling, the story is only helped because, the, because graphite stability or diamond stability is much more than that of carbonates. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, that's why, I mean, in Cindy's question, I said, I think it's a sink for oxygen, if anything, at the present day. Looks like it, at least. But what's the net, so does carbon flux out of the earth, is it mostly us forcing? Yeah. Well, that depends, on the that depends on the fact whether the carbon input and output is in balance or not. Also, right? <laughs> if, if, you have, if you have a net in gassing, then... 
Do you have you have a question? And actually, one point I think I, I brought up during your talk or right after, uh, because the carbon input to the subduction zone at the present day is dominated by the fraction that is in altered oceanic crust, going back in time, even if your CCD was different and you didn't have you know, deposition of carbonate or you know, calcareous you know, skeletons onto the ocean floor, in terms of the carbon input to the subduction zones, that may not have changed much, or it could have been even higher uh, at some point, because the alteration of the oceanic crust was sort of independent of that, right? Yes. So the, these phase diagrams show preservation of the carbonate make you wonder where the CO2 in the Earth volcanoes is coming from? Yep, that's next. <laughs> that's next. Yes. So. Actually, I mean, so I think, Lou, your number based on that Hilton's et al. study or something was 10% out, 90% in. Based on these phase diagrams, even if I do a conservative one, it would be like only 25% or so, or 30% or so out in the arcs, four arcs, and the rest going down. But some of the experimental predictions are actually even more extreme, right? I mean, they are like almost 100% preservation or 90% preservation and maybe 10% out. So there is still a little bit of a problem, like we almost are predicting too much of deep subduction and how do we then get CO2 out at arcs? Okay, there are um, a number of mechanisms I think people have proposed. O one is this uh, fluid infiltration induced decarbonation of basalts and sediments, and I think this is very similar to Lou that you were, you were mentioning in terms of the continental decarbonations. Uh, the thing that most of the thermodynamic phase diagrams or the experiments definitely by definition, we were simulating sort of bulk uh, closed system uh, decarbonation reactions. Uh, in a study in 2008, uh, 2006, Gorman and others um, treated this uh, sort of open system H2O induced decarbonation where they would, so that in their model, what they conceived is there is an infinite source of serpentine materials in the subjacent uh, lithology which would dehydrate and continuously supply water from exterior to the sort of bulk oceanic crust or sediment system, even at great depths. And if you continuously do that, you can draw down um, or break down carbonates uh, in the crust and draw down CO2. So what, for example, they showed here is in a closed system experiments, um, so this is weight percent CO2 initially locked up in the ocean crust. This is pressure. This is the subjacent H2O, there is a flux um, in, uh, sort of going in. In a closed system experiments, as you can see in the sub arc depths, still a large fraction of the original CO2 bound in oceanic crust actually stays. Whereas if you play, this, play a similar game where you, you continuously flush water th through the system and you have an infinite supply of free fluid, free water rich fluid, you can draw down CO2 tremendously. So this is one proposed explanation. Um, I mean, I think this can work. Uh, however, the question should be, do you really have that water supplier when you need it and where you need it? Um, the other thing which I actually like a lot, and Greg, you, you were part of the first study here, is, uh, and I think I sh sort of showed this slide before, is at least for the overlying sediments, many of these overlying sediments are pellitic sediments, basically granitic rocks uh, are broken down. If you calculate their densities at the, at the slab mantle interface conditions, uh, and this is shown the composition of those sediments and density calculated, these lines here are the densities of Hertzbergite or pyrolite calculated at similar pressure temperature conditions. So as you can see from 1 GPA to 3 GPA at around 700 degrees C, most of the sediments are actually lower density compared to the overlying mantle wedge, okay? So there is this possibility that instead of the sedimentary package going down with the rest of the slab in a coherent geometry, you can actually create some of these sedimentary cold diapirs, fairly deep. I mean, you know, for some of these, uh, I think, uh, uh, 
Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, I think some of these were gener getting generated as deep as 5 GPA, 6 GPA, uh, mostly around uh, 3 GPA. So if that happens, if you take these uh, sedimentary protoliths and sort of take them up into the mantle wedge, if they are not very big in dimension, they would undergo partial melting in the wedge because it's hotter in the wedge, right? So that would be one way to break down carbonates that are locked up in, in, in uh, your impure sediments. Uh, but not, not doing that along the slab mantle interface, but by detaching them, taking them up into the hotter domains of the subduction zones and doing the processing there. That could be one way to release CO2. Um, there are a couple of others probably which I'm not going to get into. Okay, okay. now this is for Bob. Uh, okay. Now the question is, my prediction based on the present day slab mantle uh, interface temperatures as a function of depth would be most of the carbonates, uh, and surely true for graphite, would be present in the slab. So that means there is this deep ingassing or influx of carbon into the mantle and not much of a release in the arcs. Was that the case throughout the, throughout the planetary history? Which, of course, goes back to some of the discussions we were having before is how early did we initiate subduction? And if, if we initiated subduction early, what was the thermal regime of that subduction? Or in other words, what was some of the potential slab mantle interface temperatures as a function of depth going back in town, uh, going back in time? Now, there are um, different ways to do this. Of course, all of these are controversial. There are geodynamic predictions. Uh, I'm familiar with one study which showed that with mantle potential temperatures as high as 175 to 250 degrees C hotter than the present day, you can still initiate subduction. And uh, to my understanding, the scaling is if the mantle wedge potential temperature is 100 degrees hotter, the slab surface temperatures at any given depth can be 50 degrees hotter, um, sort of. And then what I did here is I just you know, plowed through literature and found out where people have found absolutely dated crustal rocks of ancient ages where they have thermobarometric estimates of near peak metamorphic uh, pressure temperature conditions. And that's, those are the things that are plotted here. Next to these, each of these boxes are the ages of these crustal rocks. Here are the references here. Of course, I have no idea whether these crustal rocks, whether these crustal rocks truly represent ancient subduction zones. However, based on their lithologies, I mean, they do appear like mafic uh, lithologies, and if there are anything close to the slab mantle interface temperatures or so, then one can predict that going back in time, if you had subduction, these subduction zones were hotter, or the downgoing oceanic crust experienced hotter temperatures than we estimate today. Just for reference, I also put in this hot modern slab, which is Cascadia, and as you can see that pretty much all of these are even hotter than Cascadia. Uh, how relevant these are, I don't know. I understand this is controversial. But if I follow a path similar to this geometry, but just you know, maybe 50 to 100 degrees hotter, I can actually encounter many of these carbonate melting reactions of carbonated eclogite, okay? So based on this, I would predict that uh, in some uh, Proterozoic or New Yorkian subduction zones, carbon recycling in subduction zone could have was probably very different. In other words, you probably did release uh, CO2 uh, much more preferentially in those uh, subduction zones than you did today. I actually didn't even stop here. I was uh, <laughs> I did this crazy thing of taking all of these various estimates at any given depth and plotted them as a function of their age. Of course, this is probably really stupid, but I did it anyway. Um, what, what it shows, funny enough, that there is, if I plot that this delta T or the excess slab temperature that you would require to break down carbonates, which I can calculate, oops, sorry, which I can calculate based on if I follow a modern slab temperatures and see how much excess temperatures I need to encounter these various reactions. So that's that delta T here as a function of age from those different um, metamorphic assemblages. Looks like there was some sort of a cooling trend of the so-called 
subducting, subducting assemblages uh, with age. And these various um, boxes are the conditions that you would need to break down carbonates and induce either CO2 release or carbonate melt release by melting of basalts and sediments, and here you have pre for predotite. So based on this, it looks like enhanced CO2 released by carbonate melting in downgoing oceanic crust probably was the norm sort of at ages older than 1.3, 1.5 billion years ago. Whereas when you are sort of in this domain, the present story of deep carbon subduction holds. Whether or not this is true, I don't know. But this is very important because then this can have sort of climatic um, implication because you will be releasing much more CO2 by volcanism total. You, if you keep CO2 outflux at ridges similar, CO2 outflux at ocean island basalt similar, you have you know, significantly almost 100 times uh, sort of increase of CO2 outflux at arcs. But again, just to think about These two? Yeah. No, these two are just, uh, um, so for each of these domains, you have a higher temperature and a lower temperature with respect to these curves. So it's just that. Yeah. OK. So I think with that, I'll sort of wrap up the subduction cycling of carbon uh, side of things with some things to think about how subduction may have been different going back in the past. I will move into the role of carbon in inducing melting um, in, in sort of the background upper mantle, and perhaps in the lithospheric uh, mantle beneath continents. OK, so sort of again, I'm posing some of these questions in the context that uh, if we define mantle lithosphere or the continental lithospheric mantle as the root of continent stability, longevity, and modification or rejuvenation, what would be some of the roles carbon can play in um, creation of these carbonatitic or kimberlitic magmas or other strongly alkalic magmas through continents? And why are these magmas uh, rare in oceanic provinces and more common uh, on continents? And then can carbon-induced melting take place beneath continental lithospheric mantle or within the continental lithospheric mantle? And what is the role of partial melts in explaining some of the geophysical observations uh, beneath continents, some of the seismic observations beneath continents? Or is this story more or less right that sort of the lithospheric mantle would be defined as something dry, totally melt-free, whereas it's sort of floating above asthenosphere, which is hydrated, and melt bearing. Is this story true? OK. So the first uh, sort of uh, basics of how carbon can affect melting or how carbonates can affect melting comes from this phase diagram. So I think I showed this, this line to you guys before in my uh, last week's lecture. This is the volatile free peridotite solidus. It has a positive Clapeyron slope, temperature increasing to the right, pressure decreasing downward. However, when you have trace amount of CO2 present with mantle peridotite, something interesting happens at around 2 gigapascal uh, pressure, so pressure of around, uh, depth of around 70 kilometers or so. What happens here is you have a series of carbonation reactions where CO2 in the fluid can react with mantle minerals like phosphorite, diopside, to form dolomite here for this reaction to form magnesite here in this reaction and to form magnesite here in this reaction, right? So whereas at low pressure, CO2 actually has very little influence in reducing the solidus temperatures because it's present as a C plus 4 fluid. It barely reduces uh, solidus temperatures. If you go deeper at around 2 GPA, it dramatically reduces the solidus temperature because you are changing the lithology so here, down here, at temperatures lower than this line, your rock is no longer olivine, OPX, CPX, and garnet. You have olivine, OPX, CPX, and garnet, and trace amount of carbonate minerals, either dolomite or magnesite at deeper depths. Right? And when you have that, the near solidus melting is dominated by melting of the trace carbonate mineral phases. As a consequence, the solidus temperature 
is 300 to 600 degrees Celsius lower than your dry solidus or volatile free periodic solidus. Across this solidus, if you go if you go from here to there or from here to there, you generate a melt that is not a basaltic melt, but a carbonate melt. So very much similar to that carbonatite eruption I showed you, very similar to that sort of a melt. It has around 45% CO2 less than 10% silica. Okay. Yes. Yeah, very good question. So the question is, how much CO2 do I have here, or how much carbonates do I have here? Um, you can have as much as 10%, 20% CO2. You can have as less as 10 ppm CO2. Or to this, uh, yes, so that, the, the interesting thing is, this curve does not depend on how much CO2 or carbonates you have. If you have more CO2, you will have more carbonates, and as a consequence, Across the solidus, you can generate more carbonate melt. If you have less CO2, you will have less amount of modal uh, proportion of carbonates, and you will generate less amount of carbonate melts. But this reaction is invariant with respect to the amount of carbon present. And that's very unique. Uh, when we talked about the role of water in inducing melting, the solidus depression was directly a, you know, a factor of how much water you have in the system. When you added more water, your nominally anhydrous minerals were more water rich and you depressed the solidus more. In this case, that's not the case. It's actually somewhat simpler. It's almost a step, step function. No matter how much carbon you have, you have that solidus. Okay? Any other questions on this? Okay. Um, so, again, uh, we sort of knew this shape of the carbonate bearing peridotite solidus going back, I think as early as uh, late 1970s with Peter Wiley's work, Dave Egler's work, and so on. Uh, the thing that probably happened in the last 15 years or so is people realizing, oh, this is pretty cool, but what happens to this solidus as you go deeper and whether or not uh, your solid mantle adiabat, which would be somewhere here, can intersect this solidus even deeper, not just below continents, but below oceans, below ocean, island, ocean islands or below uh, mid-oceanic ridges. So that's sort of now our understanding of that carbonated peridotite solidus. See, I greatly expanded the pressure scale. I think in my previous plot, I had it only about 3, 4 GPA. Now this is going down to 35 GPA. And this is not really relevant for your uh, continental lithospheric story, but I just uh, wanted to show you. So now there are many experiments. This is a parameterized fit through all those experimental data, taking into account difference in slight difference in bulk composition between various labs and so on. But based on that, what now we predict, if we are interested in melt generation or the initiation of magma generation beneath mid-oceanic ridges, this solidus can be encountered as deep as 300 kilometers or so. Okay? But this is beneath mid-oceanic ridges. This is not, your, not, not, not beneath continents. Okay? And if you do that melting, you will generate this very small amount of carbonate melt if, you, if your mantle source concentration is 100 ppm CO2. So this sort of goes back to your question. I have only 100 ppm CO2. I know how much CO2 is in the melt, 40%. You do the ratio of the two, you get how much, what's the melt fraction, right? If you increase uh, this uh, CO2 content of the source before melting by 10 times, you will get 10 times more melt. But nothing else changes. Okay. okay. The thing that uh, happened more recently is uh, not only now we know that carbonated peridotite solidus is uh, much lower than that of the dry or CO2-free peridotite solidus, but CO2 can also induce c stabilization of silicate mills with variable amount of CO2 dissolved in them at temperatures distinctly lower than that of the CO2-free peridotite solidus, right? So in other words, as you step up in temperature from this carbonated peridotite solidus where you generate a truly carbonate-rich melt, meaning 40% CO2 or so, what happens as you step up in temperature? Where do you transition from that carbonate melt to a more normal basaltic melt? And what we found, some of us, including Greg, worked on this, uh, we find that these are the isoplets of constant CO2 content in the melt, meaning if you go to this temperature, you will generate a magma with 
dissolved CO2. If you go to this sort of temperatures, you will generate a melt with 15% dissolved CO2 and so on, right? And interestingly enough, based on the partial melt compositions, we know that there is a very nice, almost minus one slope, negative correlation between the CO2 content of the melt and silica content of the melt. So you can pretty much cast all of these CO2 isoplates in terms of sil melt silica content isoplates, okay? And based on that, what we know that, again, if you are trying to understand melting beneath mid-oceanic ridges, your deep melts, maybe not the carbonate melts, but even, even, even very deep at around 200 kilometers or so, you will start generating these primary kimberlite type of melts. That melt will eventually evolve to melolithic melts, nephilinitic melts, so less and less silica undersaturated melts because you, your adiabat is crossing through all these lines and approaching the peridotite solidus, right? So again, just keep in mind, as a function of depth beneath ridges, deeper and deeper melts are less and less silica rich, right? However, that story would change when we come below continents, right? And the other cool thing about this is if you know these uh, melt CO2 isoplates and if you have some estimates of the source CO2 content, just again going back to simple mass balance uh, equation or batch melting equation, which we, we talked about in the last lecture, you can calculate the melt fraction of relevance here. So if you know the CO2 content in the liquid, which are these numbers, if you have some uh, estimates of how much CO2 is in the source before the rock started to melt, the D for CO2 is effectively zero. So that equation would reduce to something like this. You can calculate F as a function of bulk CO2 content of the rock and CO2 content of the melt. So as a function of upwelling, you can calculate not only the magma composition, but the amount of magma you expect to generate for a given amount of CO2 in the source. Okay. But you'll be like, why are you showing this? Uh, because this is ridges, this is below ridges. We are really interested in what happens below continents or in the continental lithospheric mantle, right? And before I get to that, you should also ask me, what about water? Because so far, everything I told you is oh, how CO2 depresses melting, how CO2 reduces silicate melting. How do we plug in the effect of water? I mean, I showed you, I think, in the last lecture how water affects melting, but then I was not talking about how CO2 affects melting. But in the real world, I think you'll have to worry about the two species together. Both. So if you add water to the system, how do you expect these lines should go? Should they move up or should they move down? Move down, right? Meaning water should even enhance melting. It should, that means if you add water to the system, these CO2 isoplates should even go to lower temperature. But how do you do that? Those experiments turn out to be hard and we haven't done that, but we still plugged in the effect of water somehow. And the story is here. What is this guy doing? What? Putting salt on ice, why? Depress the freezing point, right? So in salt water system, you know, uh, and again, you know, I was doing graduate studies in Minnesota, so I used to see this very often. So I'm like, oh yeah, freezing point depression, freezing point. <laughs> right, um, the same thing, uh, works for magma as well. So if you add water to the magma, it reduces its stability, I mean, it expands its stability field, it reduces uh, the temperature where it can be stable. So you can play the same game of plugging in cryoscopic equation. So if you can estimate somehow how much water would be present in these magmas that are 25% CO2 rich or 10% or, or CO2 bearing, you can calculate how those lines will be shifted, okay? And uh, this is a very simple diagram for phosphorite water system, but the same story would apply for a carbonated silicate magma and water system as well. So all you need to know is how much water is in the melt, and if you know how much water, you know how much liquidus depression will take place, this delta T, right? So this is, again, phosphorite water. What we want to do is a carbonated silicate melt and how that temperature shifts as a function of water in the magma. 
So the thing that we need to first get at is how much water would there be in this magma? How do we get that? I think during Greg's talk, he quickly touched on this fact that if you melt a rock, uh, there is this equilibrium partitioning of water between olivine and magma, right? All of you guys know about incompatible trace elements, right? You can treat water or hydrogen sort of as an incompatible trace elements. So you can define an equilibrium partition coefficient between silicate minerals like olivines, pyroxenes, and the coexisting magma, okay? And people have spent an enormous amount of time figuring out how that partition coefficient, D of water, between peridotite and basaltic melt varies as a function of various intensive variables, pressure, temperatures, compositions, and so on. And this is what I show here, that how that D varies as a function of temperatures. Well, the first thing to keep in mind, the Ds are much smaller than one. In other words, water behaves as an incompatible element. If you make melt, no matter how you make it, maybe by CO2 addition or by something else, water will partition from the silicates to the magma. If your water partitions to the magma, the stability field in, in terms of temperature of that magma will expand, right? But in order to calculate how much water will be in our CO2 bearing basalts, we can again go back to this equation. What we need is the CO2 content of, uh, sorry, water content of this liquid as a function of water content in the source. We need the D of water, which is shown here, how as a function of pressure, D varies. And we can calculate F based on what I told you before, right? So if we, if we know F, if we know the D of water here, we can calculate amount of water. If we can calculate the amount of water, we can use this cryoscopic approximation to figure out how those isoplasts would shift to lower temperature, okay? So just, just to give you one number, for a carbonated silicate partial melt with 25% CO2, uh, and if, you, if your rock that was undergoing that silicate melting had 200 ppm water, that melt will also have six weight percent water in it, okay? Of course, if you plug in more water in the source, there will be more water in the melt. If you have less CO2 in the source, then your F will be lower, you will have more water in the melt, okay? Okay, so then I'm going to show you how as a function of dry system CO2 bearing and CO2 bearing as well as hydrous, how these uh, melting reactions may take place beneath continents or in the continental lithospheric mantle or near the base of the continental lithospheric mantle. So this is pretty much a plot I borrowed, I think, from Sinti's uh, annual reviews, Earth and Planetary Science uh, papers. What I show here are, again, the volatile free peridotite solidus. This is that carbonated peridotite solidus, meaning across which you generate this carbonatitic magma, okay? And superimposed on that, I have these various continental shield geotherms for different uh, sort of uh, amount of heat flow on the surface, so 80 to 40 milliwatt per meter square heat flow. And then you also have the PT estimates based on xenolith data from various cratonic uh, conditions and as well as Colorado Plateau here. So what you can see is as a function of depth, as you go deeper and deeper beneath continents, if you are between this 50 and 40 milliwatt per meter square uh, heat flow within this uh, xenolith domain, you can encounter carbonate melting at around 100 kilometers depth or so, right? And of course, even deeper. You do not encounter the dry or the volatile free periodite solidus. However, you can encounter this carbon-influenced melting, okay? This is, this is from a previous plot, so I'll come back to this, what it is, okay? So now what about this kimberlite generation, all these isoplates that I showed you before? If I do the same game now, again, it's the same uh, diagram, but now I have added in those isoplates of CO2, meaning these are silicate magma with various amount of CO2, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 2.5, and so on. So this is for a system that is dry, so no water, 100 ppm CO2 in the system, and this is the same plot for 100 ppm CO2 in the system, 200 ppm water in the system as well. See how these curves now shift to lower temperature as I added water, 
So again, what I'm doing is by having water, I'm partitioning some water into the magma. I'm expanding the stability field of magma. As a consequence, these lines are shifting to lower temperatures. If you have more water, these lines will shift as well. OK, so based on this, what would be your prediction? So beneath continents, again, in the continental lithospheric mantle, as, as you are gradually warming up, as you go deeper and deeper, at, at sort of shallow depths, 100, 150 kilometers depth, you will be somewhere here. That means you can generate a carbonate magma or carbonatite. Okay? But as you go deeper and deeper and gradually approach this solid mantle adiabat, I believe this is for 1350 mantle potential temperature, 1350 C mantle potential temperatures. When you are up here at the very deep part of the xenolite, xenolite data that is now shown in this plot, you can encounter these isoplates, meaning you will be generating kimberlites or very strongly silica undersaturated magma with high amount of CO2. And same thing here, of course, now you can even generate uh, sort of kimberlite to melitite transition, sort of uh, relatively CO2, relatively CO2 poor magma as well. And the, and the blue dotted line or the dashed line here shows your um, graphite to diamond transition, just, just for reference. Yes. So the 38 to 45 percent is along here. Sorry, I did not mark that. So just across this line, around here, you have 40 to 45 percent CO2 in the melt. And as you step up in temperature, your CO2 dilutes because you are melting more and more, and you transition into a more basaltic type magma. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So based on this uh, simple story, I would predict at the base of the continental lithospheric magma you can, uh, or, or mantle, you can generate a kimberlitic melt. And at somewhat shallower depth within the continental lithospheric man mantle, you can generate carbonate melt. Okay. But I think... Yeah, they are rare because, I mean, the carbon content of the, of the background mantle is very low, so you'll have to have a mechanism of concentrating them and then channelizing them, erupting them. So that's, that sort of goes into a dynamic uh, question, how you, how you focus the melt, how you erupt the melt. This is sort of the condition where you would generate them. Ah, uh, that's more along the line of Joe or, well, no, I, 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 well, ballpark, I think you can separate. These are very low density, low viscosity magma, and the dihedral angle, as I know, for these systems are less than 30 degree, okay? So they should be connected, fairly well connected. Now, some people argue that they should be even so well connected that they should even form uh, grain boundary films rather than grain boundary tubules. And depending on that, I think the relative mobility and you know less mobility may may, may differ. And I, I don't think there are numbers done for absolutely these magma compositions. They are done for somewhat simplified carbonate melt compositions. But Roberta. Yeah. Well. So yeah. I mean, so, clearly. So th this solidus, which you know. In, with addition of variable amount of water, maybe even slightly lower or so. So this is your freezing boundary, right? As you, getting, as you are getting shallower and shallower, you are moving up along any of these geotherms. And here you have a silicate magma with 20% CO2 dissolved in it as you get shallower and shallower. Now you have a carbonate magma with 40% CO2. But as, as soon as you cross this boundary, your solid carbonates, right? So yeah, if you follow this equilibrium path, you should not have any eruption. But in order to have eruption, we know we have eruption. We know we have kimberlitic magmas bringing diamonds up. So we are definitely somehow releasing these melts, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah, even then, you must, have, must form some sort of... Uh, yeah. Mobile. Yeah. 
Well, and that's, I think that's entirely possible because I have not said anything about the source of CO2 in these in this lithospheric mantles, right? So it's entirely possible that the formation of this carbonate, small amount of carbonate bearing lithospheric mantle peridotite actually was triggered by some deeper asthenospheric melts at some stage getting implanted. So your isotopic signature may come from a prior event. I mean, this is sort of, so yeah, you definitely probably have multiple stages of melting, freezing, melting, freezing, and so on. So that, I, I, I would not rule that out. Yeah, that's totally fine, I think. Yes, Emily. Not, not that I know of. The problem with, uh, you know, estimating carbon content by directly looking at xenoliths is, uh, is actually <laughs> this, uh, this ledge right here. If you go through this ledge, you, you, you break down carbonate minerals or carbonate melts and release CO2. So wh whenever we study any xenoliths that are brought up along any sort of high temperature geotherms, carbonates are not preserved in most of them. People write papers when they find carbonates in a mantle peridotite and say, oh, we found carbonates, a new paper. Uh, not sure. Oh, uh, well, I mean, you're, in, order for, in order for this melting to take place, your subsolidus mantle peridotite does not need to have carbonates concentrated. I mean, you can have, as, 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 as I said, you can have very small amount of carbonates dispersed through your samples, and still you will have this melting. It's just, I think the question of mobiliz mobilization and concentration comes after partial melting. How do you concentrate and focus it and get critical enough melt fraction so that you can erupt. Yeah, that's a, that's a dynamic question, I think. Yes? Roger, another way to, to explain the fact that the collection of carbonates are only in continents is using exactly this model, but it's not the source is in the lithosphere, it's that the mantle that's rising from below the lithosphere runs into the buffer of, of the lithosphere. So basically, you're, you're bringing mantle from deeper. It's encountering exactly the melting curve that you're showing. And the reason it doesn't keep melting and making basalts stop because it bumps into the lithosphere and so it basically is stopped at 1% melting instead of going on to the That's entirely po possible that you have an upwelling beneath this deep continental lithospheric mantle and that's encountering the bumper but this is this actually what I will actually question do you really need that because based on this model which I actually put together last night so take it with a grain of salt um, <laughs> you can you, you do encounter these isoplates sort of at the, at the deeper portion of the lithospheric mantle. So do you need this background asthenospheric flow to, to give you that kimberlytic melt, which is entirely possible. I cannot rule that out. But just in a static sort of lithospheric mantle getting hotter and hotter uh, you know, down depth, you can stabilize this magma as well. So how do we, how do we differentiate? I don't know. Sure. Well, that, 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 that goes back to my point of what was the origin of creating this carbonated peridotite in the lithospheric mantle. That may involve an implantation event of getting melts from deeper below, which is totally fine, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, sorry, yeah, Meredith. Sorry. Ooh. In, well, before melting? Yeah. Before melting, it sits as a mineral phase, as magnesite. Okay. So it's a magnesite, olivine, OPX, CPX, garnet, bearing rock. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so Raj, you have 10 minutes. Sure. Okay, so I'm sort of done. I'll just throw you one more carve ball before I finish. And whether this scenario that I told you so far is actually right. And if it's right, and too bad that Barbara is not here. I mean, she, I think, showed this model of, you know, S wave speed as a function of depth beneath continents, these solid lines. And when I look at them, there are sort of two uh, negative bumps of shear wave speed at around 100 kilometers and maybe 250 kilometers or so. I'll just pose the question whether some of those have any relations to the two melting possibilities I talked about. One, carbonate melt generation at around 100 kilometers depth, and maybe a kimberlytic or a more basaltic type magma at around 200, 250 kilometers depth. 
This is new. I haven't published it, but something I would like to hear more from you if that's, enter that's at all possible or not. Okay. The last uh, complication with this story is what uh, I hate, this thing called oxygen fugacity. <laughs> totally hate that thing. Um, the problem with carbon is so far pretty much all the story I told you about is about melting of a carbonate-bearing rock or melting of a rock with CO2-rich fluid. So that means carbon is in plus four state, right? However, as you know, there is diamond, there is graphite. So if you reduce the system, you can store carbon in the form of diamond or graphite. So where is carbon in peridotite? Well, it could be in diamond. It doesn't have to be in magnesite. And there is actually this uh, oxygen fugacity buffer reaction called EMOD or EMOG buffer. Instatite, magnesite reacting to form olivine, graphite or diamond and releasing oxygen, right? So as you reduce the system, you can go from left side of this reaction to the right side of the reaction. And what is shown here is based on some of the recent experiments is the FO2 limit that marks the coexistence of diamond and magnesite along this, along this buffer reaction right here, okay? However, there is also this interesting thing is if you express FO2, if you write an equilibrium constant of this reaction and express FO2, you can qu quickly see that the FO2 that limits the stability of a carbonate phase is dependent on the activity of magnesite in that phase, right? So if it's a pure magnesite, then the line is here. But then if this magnesite is a dilute, if it is a diluted component in another phase, or let's say maybe in a melt or a magma, then you can expand the FO2 limit over which that magma can be stable with dissolved magnesite in it, right? And that's what is shown here. So as you go to higher and higher temperature, all the carbonates go into the magma. CO2 in the melt keeps getting diluted as you go to higher and higher temperature. And this boundary along which your neutral carbon or diamond or a carbonate-bearing melt can be stable expands, meaning you can have that magma even to relatively lower oxygen fugacity. Okay? So two things we need to know in order to evaluate or, or test whether all these stories I told you so far with carbonated silicate melting or carbonate melting beneath continents, whether that holds, is where is this boundary and how the oxygen fugacity beneath continents varies as a function of depth. Okay, so this is the first one, how, how, where is the boundary? The second one comes from looking at xenoliths by trying to do these things, what we call oxybarometry, like figuring out the oxygen fugacity based on a reaction. So this is one of those reactions people use. This is formation of garnet. It's a component in garnet called skiagite. It forms as a function of increasing pressure by reaction of oxygen with orthopyroxene and olivine. And people can calibrate a reaction like this to, sorry, this got cut off, um, to express uh, FO2 as a function of activity of skiagite in garnet, activity of uh, faolite in olivine, activity of uh, ferrocellite in OPX, and so on. And based on that, based on all these xenoliths that I think, most of these xenoliths, I think, Cindy, you plotted in your, in your figure, if you express FO2 of those, they follow or define a trend like this. So again, pressure increasing to the right, oxygen fugacity, so as you go down, you are getting more reduced. So as you can imagine, if as a function of depth you are getting reduced, at some point you may cross that carbonate to diamond boundary and you may never have melting, okay? There, as it turns out, there is a more recent calibration of this. Uh, there was some problem with the previous uh, calibration. So again, it's the same plot, depth increasing to the right, oxygen fugacity getting more reduced downward. All of these uh, data points are Oxygen fugacity est estimates from various garnet peridotite samples, from Kavval craton, from Canadian shield, from Siberian craton, and so on. And also shown on top of that are these various melt CO2 isoplates. In this case, they are expressed as mole percent of carbonates rather than weight percent CO2, but they are sort of similar. So what you would predict based on this is there is this broad swath of negative trend of decreasing uh, oxygen fugacity as a function of increasing depth. 
So if you follow this arrow something like this, at some points you may cross these boundaries of going from a silicate magma with dissolved carbonates to a diamond bearing peridotite, right? And people actually have put a lot of emphasis on this average trend and predicting where you would cross this boundary, whether it's around 150 or you know 175 or so on. However, I would also point out that there is a huge variability at any given depth of the oxygen fugacity estimates from various continental lithospheric samples, as much as three to four orders of uh, you know, magnitude of log FO2 variation. Okay? So you may have this scenario at the base of the continental lithospheric mantle where you do have a gradual reduction with depth, but different domains of the continental lithospheric mantles are variably oxidized or reduced. And that may create melting in some domains, freezing and diamond formation in other domains. Now I'll skip this. So although now here you have this funky looking solidus curve, but I think this is entirely realistic. You may have scenario at shallow depths where the oxygen fugacity is not so reduced that carbonate is destabilized. It's still oxidized enough and you can create a carbonate magma at around this depth as you are following this continental geotherm. But then at certain depth, it, you get reduced. If you get reduced, now you have diamond in peridotite. Diamond has almost no effect in doing your freezing point depression game. You are back to this volatile free peridotite solidus. Then maybe in some other even deeper depths, now you can stabilize that silicate magma with dissolved CO2. So it has an expanded oxygen fugacity field. And you can probably again stabilize that sort of magma. So deep, but still oxidized enough to have a silicate melt. Okay? So you can have this very interesting transition from generation of melt very deep at the base of the lithosphere, freezing of that melt, no melting, again, some other kind of melting event, shallower. And I just wonder whether a model like that talks to those seismic images that I showed you before. Okay. So I think I'll end with this diagram, sort of a summary of the continental lithospheric mantle modification, rejuvenation. I think, Adrian, you showed a figure like this from Foley. Foley talked about erosion of the lithospheric, base of the lithospheric mantle by uh, melt impregnation and making different pods of the lithospheric mantle denser and making them fall off. But you can go the other way as well. If you extract the melt, you can make different domains of the mantle depleted. Uh, less hydrous, so you can stabilize as well. So here you have the shear wave velocity speed as a function of depth beneath continents. Here is my funky model that came out lot late last night. And here you have Foley's story. With that, I'll stop. Five minutes. Back there. That's right. Yeah, you just have to have, you just have to have this kimberlite window deeper than your graphite diamond transition. As long as you have that, you can bring diamonds up. However, I, I would like to point out. I mean, I sort of don't like this, you know, 1D model of reduction, oxidation reduction with depth. I think laterally they can be extremely heterogeneous. So uh, I almost don't like averages. Uh, our average FO2 as a function of depth, I think we should allow the variability as well. Yeah, your solidus curves are the, clearly funky, but your geotherms are less funky, I think. I've got a big problem with some of your geotherms. I don't know how, how you've calculated them, but the 40 really? milliwatts per meter squared, that doesn't even uh, reach into the idea about until these very large depths. I would, uh, well, I'll talk about it Friday, but I think okay. these, these geotherms are a little bit uh, unfunky, let's say. <laughs> From um, early in your talk, and I guess Lou's talk also, um, you seem to show an imbalance in the carbon budget where there's more going into the mantle than it's coming back out. So I guess what's the long-term global consequence for uh, how the mantle works? Right. I can only give you my bias or perspective. Uh, I think at the present day you have a net in gassing. Although if you look, if you compile all the literature, if you do not do any filtering, 
you can be left with a conclusion, oh, there is a net outgassing, or it's a steady state, or it's a net ingassing. But when I do my filtering, I get a um, little bit of net ingassing. But that's present day. Remember, I, I also have showed you a model where I can sort of dial in a much greater flux of uh, out, uh, arc out flux uh, going back in time. So, that was based on a, a hotter earth. Or hotter that's right. So if that's the case, then it may have changed through time as well. In the present day, maybe net in gassing, but that doesn't mean that's the way our planet operated throughout. Yes? Uh, I was wondering about uh, some basic information. One is what is the temperature of those uh, carbonatite magmas when they pour out of the Earth? When they pour out, I mean, the problem is at the present day, there is only one active volcano. It's this Aldonio Lengai, and they are erupting a carbonate magma that is nothing close to a primary carbonate magma. They are erupting natural carbonatites, almost pure sodium carbonate melt. And their liquidus temperature is around 500 degrees or so. But I don't think that, that they are anything close to being representative carbonate melt uh, liquidus temperatures in the mantle. I showed you some of them. They are like, at least would be like 900 to 950, even if you have water, but like up to 1100, 1200. Well, the, the other question is that do we have a map showing the distribution of uh, carbonatites and kimberlites and their age of eruption, also the age of the country rocks, for instance? We, yeah, that map exists. I just don't happen to have it here. But yeah, that, that's been done. Yeah. Anybody else? So somebody commented on the, the fact that carbonatites and uh, melilites or kimberlites are rare. Is that, is, that, uh, is that really true, or is it each time uh, people have been looking at continental rifts, they, they found some carbonatites? So uh, have they been sampled uh, adequately? Is it, uh, is it something that has been mapped? I, yeah, uh, I don't think frequency-wise they are rare. I think volumetrically they are minor. That, that statement I would agree with compared to basalt. But I don't think in terms of just, you know, spatial distribution or frequency of their occurrence, it's rare. It's plenty. I mean, many of these are, well, the silica undersaturated magmas are plenty abundant even on ocean islands. Uh, very common. I mean, tholeites are actually uncommon in ocean islands, to be honest. Sinti, okay, you had a... Last question. Oh. All he, right. he prefers one lunch. Somebody, uh... Oh, yeah, there one more over there. Can you use the isotopic composi composition to determine where, what the source of the outgassed uh, CO2 is? Yeah, you can. I mean, uh, well, for magmas or carbonate magmas or kimberlites or even basalts, people have used long, you know, sort of long-lived radi radiogenic isotopes. Um, there are some carbonatites, especially on oceans, uh, some actually even on continents, which have recycle signature, like high mu type of signature as well. There are some carbonatites which have noble gas uh, isotopic evidence of primordial carbon in them. So there you have an entire range of carbon being primordial to carbon uh, being recycled. Uh, people also look at uh, carbon isotopic composition, like stable isotopes. And uh, so I haven't talked about that, but most of the basalts that erupt, they are minus five. So that's your mantle carbon. But in arcs, uh, there is a definite evidence of more positive carb delta 13 C close to approaching zero. And that's, that's the reason why people think most of the arc volcanic CO2 is not coming from the mantle wedge, but coming from the slab, uh, because carbonates that are going down are near zero. Uh, so yeah people, yeah, people do that. Is that the sediment part of the slab or the basaltic? Both. Bo both, because I mean, it's carbonate. So yeah, either it's either it's carbonate sediments or calcite precipitated on ocean floor. Um, both are none of them are minor. Well, so the carbon that is dissolved in your basaltic glass in in marb is probably minus five, but that's not the bulk fraction of your carbon budget going down. It's the altered fraction that's all close to zero. Okay.